Network traffic analysis was designed for the mines, but the first client just happened to be a bank, and they sent us 98 gigs of their DMZ, which wasn't <laughs> planned for, but we weren't going to turn the work away. And also, really, it was a proving ground. So it took us about a month to analyze that first job. Of course, we were only charging them like for a week's worth of work, but it took us a month, and then a month became a week, and then a week became a day, and a day became an hour, hour became a minute, and then a minute became real time. Um, and that's when we realized, actually, we had mistakenly built the product. And we tried everything. We tried AI, we tried machine learning, we went through signature kind of uh, uh, analysis, and eventually we found that mathematics was the one thing it didn't need to learn. Um, it was fast Bayesian mathematics specifically, it was fast, it could process, and it could actually deliver really, really good results. Um, Wait, which kind of mathematics? Bayesian. Bayesian, what, what, what does that mean? Ah, okay. You're, you're saying that technical, but you love math, so it's just... Some... No, 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 no. So, so, so Bayesian mathematics is actually quite easy to understand. Bayesian mathematics is also what a lot of the other non-signature-based technologies like Snowed are using for detection. They're all... all we somehow as a collective, collective mm. consciousness, we all came up with this idea that Bayesian mathematics would work. Mm, that, um, I love maths, but I haven't heard of it. But so if every day I give you uh, 10 apples and two oranges, and today so far I've given you one apple and one orange, what's the probability that the next fruit I give you is going to be an apple versus it being an orange? Mm. Right? So very high probability. That's basically Bayes' theorem. Um, I know it sounds it sounds um, it sounds simple, but that's essentially what it is. And if you want a good idea of where you use it in everyday life, think about your spam filter. So it goes through your spam email, and every time it sees the word pills, Viagra, medication the probability of this being a spam email suddenly becomes the apples in the apples and oranges scenario. And that's that's pretty much base, right? So it looks at it looks at uh the probability of um something being malicious um um based on on um on on what it knows of your environment and what it's learned of your environment, and um, it scores it accordingly. And if you're, um, you know, if you're an intelligence agency, you're going to set that filter for scoring really low. And if you're, you know, public Wi-Fi at McDonald's, you're going to set that, you know, that threshold really high. And it kind of understands the difference between the two. And then it can detect threats. But if you think about it... Um, you know, there's a big delta between what is artificial intelligence, what is machine learning, and what is, you know, cognitive computing or and mathematics. But there's a definitely a relationship, as like a common thread that that's you know goes through. So Bayesian mathematics, um, when you use it in terms of uh, a Bayes theorem or or, or, or uh, a Bayesian filter, for example. Uh, is very much considered machine learning, right? Um, the, um, I mean, I think that's the 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 relationship. I think where people sometimes get it wrong, where it's difficult for me, um, especially in the market today, is people use terminology like artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, interchangeably, and for me, it's not. You know, machine learning is a subcomponent that goes into creating artificial intelligence along with the likes of computer vision, et cetera. So for me, it's very hard when people say, oh, does your cybersecurity product have AI? I don't know whether to say yes or no, because the truth of the matter is um, you can't use the two interchangeably. It has machine learning, but, you know, it doesn't have all the other components that go up into the overarching, um, you know, title of 
of AI. And I think there is a little bit of a, a marketing play using words like autonomy and autonomous when actually it's automated. So when mm -hmm. people ask you, hey, you know, is it autonomous? It's so like, well, actually, there's nothing that's autonomous. Yeah, autonomous may be in the English sense of the word, but not in the computer science sense, right? And um, yeah, so there's a, there's a very big correlation. But I think, um, and it's not that I'm a purist or anything like that. It's just, you know, I don't want to... But I, th I think that's what people actually understand is AI, because that general artificial intelligence is obviously it's not here. Hmm. Uh, yeah, if you're saying completely autonomous, then I don't know, this machine will be so smart to figure everything out. And oh, yeah, how are you? This, yeah. This. yeah, I think that's, but it's hard, yeah. right? It's 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 hard for me to market something as AI when I think it's not AI, as autonomous when I think it's just automated. And, um, but it's, you know, it's also difficult to exist in a market where people use language like that quite freely, right? Mm. You know, they, um, I did an article once about one in every three, I can't remember the exact number of AI products actually have no AI. Um, you know, and I think, I think a large part of, um, I think in the, when you think about the cybersecurity market, I think the amount of product we have and diversity, um, you know, it can't sustain itself um, in the existing market with mm. the existing demand. And I think what that causes us to do is, of course, compete. And um, when we're competing, you know, that's when our sales and marketing tends mm. to overtake our actual engineering. Sure. You know, and, and, and the narrative with sales and marketing becomes, ah, uh, we're going to, we're going to stop, uh, you know, 100% threat detection. There's no such thing as 100% threat detection. No, sure. I understand uh, why they're marketing it that way. I understand how they scored 100% on a certain type of detection sort of um, uh, criteria. But nobody thinks, well, it's a bit misleading to the mm. consumer, right? Yeah. Um, also, um, you know, stopping ransomware in its tracks. Like every one that every single product I've seen over the last, I think now you can't actually launch a computer progress software without actually saying oh, it's got AI. Oh, well, <laughs> something unbelievable, right? But but even for for anything, it's like every single one. It's like almost mandatory since the hype train came along. Now it's like you know, it's also yeah, you know, got some AI in it. Yeah, but the, the well, one thing is that the the market. It's 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 amazing how the market is educated not by the white papers you know that the the scholars release but by the marketing material mm. that you know the marketing department puts out you know to to sell the product um you know when when people talk about you know white papers so often the source of that that white paper is really some form of marketing um and i think sometimes that can be misleading um, I think um, I think that's one of the that's one of the things we need to be careful that in our quest for success, we do not fall prey to making statements that are unrealistic and untrue, and even in in the face of adversity and competition, and even though our opponents um, or our comp competitors um, may do that not to fall into that trap. I think there's something to be said for being authentic, honest, and true in what you deliver. And, um, and you know, not letting your marketing and sales department uh, override your actual engineering capability. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. What but, I, but I think any, yeah, for sure, you know. Uh, but I think any good CIO, CISO, Whoever is responsible for no. for keeping this stuff, they also know that it's 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 bluff. I mean, you're not going to pull the wool over their eyes, and, and you know they they know this. They've been doing it for a while. There's no such thing as you know 100 percent, or this isn't the magic bullet, or whatever you know. 100 percent, you know. And um, but I mean, in the same breath, we wouldn't exist 
if it wasn't for the marketing of some of our competitors. Because in the early days, the reason why snow didn't sell for so many years was people didn't understand what snowed was. And, um, you know, we'd go into, I can remember going into Altron. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything bad about Altron. But Altron was looking at the snow appliance. And the guy from Altron told me, yeah, but I've got a firewall and it's got an IDS. It's like, yeah, but this is so much more than IDS. It's like, uh, you know, but it detects threats, right? And it stops them. That my firewall does. So he couldn't, he couldn't break away from, from that model of thinking or from what he understood an intrusion detection system to be to this new idea of a, you know, of a network detection and response system, which is what we call it today. Until our very smart competitors came into the market and sort of educated the market. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword because in one way I'm saying, hey, the marketing guys and the sales guys and, you know, they're leading education in the market and it's not a great thing. But a large part of my success hinged on how beautifully they articulated what Snow does for... Yeah, I think the irony in that is amazing, right? And um, I'll I'll never forget one of the be- most beautiful articulations. Again, you know, it's a pretty. I'm not saying, but uh, you know, how, I'm, I'm choosing not to mention any vendor names, but I'm sure a lot of people will know who I'm talking about. Um, and it's a compliment. They beautifully articulated what we did by comparing it to the immune system, right? And I, I remember the first time reading it and I was like, wow, that's a pretty amazing way to help somebody understand what, you know, we're trying to do. And um, although I don't think we have the same product and I don't think they think we have the same product either. Um, so can you give us that analogy? How does it compare to this? I'm coming into the room telling the guy from Altron that, listen, I've got this detection system that uses Bayesian mathematics and it can detect stuff that you can't and it will respond to an attack automatically in real time. And he's thinking, oh, you're describing my my my, my firewall. I'm almost getting... <laughs> no, no, I mean like the immune system because those are careful from my science and maths. Maths is the language of the universe. We're kind of just figuring out the rules and then those things that we can prove that kind of is maths. That's kind of how I understand maths to be. Um, science is, okay, we can mostly reproduce it. It's a thing, but, you know, it's different than proven. Well, if you, you think of the immune system. And, and you think of... Uh, so basically everything there is is in discovered and not invented. Like all these things that people... All the inventions which we made were actually discoveries of the laws of the universe and how the actual world work somebody kind of and we're replicating the um, most of the things that we do with technology is we're replicating what we can see and trying to replicate it even like in simple terms you know I believe like courage should be representing of the real world as much as possible you should describe your business things you should you know, just semantically but you know neural networks are based on how the brain works and there's yeah. so much stuff, you know, that we learn from nature or anything. It's not really you invented how the brain works. You discovered how the brain works or how the hummingbird flies or a helicopter or something. That's very true. So that's true for snow. Snow comes from principles in physics uh, like the observer effect. The observer effect means if I tell tell you, I give you a camera and I tell you to go and photograph gorillas in their natural habitat would you actually be able to do that and the observer effect is would say no because by virtue of you being in their natural habitat with the camera they would not alter their behavior right um so well all those are that i think in quantum theory there's something there's a property to electrons or to atoms that they the Scientifically, reproducibly, on many tests, they behave differently. Whether whether you're busy watching them or not, busy watching them, it's really like bogus. But when you think about it, but you know, if, if you 
film how the electrons flow in a in a way when you're busy filming it and then you're not filming it, it's different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, um, the, um, I know, I know what you're you're speaking about. Like when you try to measure something speed, but by putting the instrument of measurement, you affect the speed um, by measuring. Um, and th- th- that's similar to that's similar to um, um, very similar to what how we build Snowed, right? Because that's the inspiration for Snowed is if you introduce a rogue agent into any sort of state, into any system, it'll have a change of state. So those components which you do control and you do monitor, their behavior will change. And if you could understand those subtle changes in behavior and attribute them to some form of threat, well, it's a different way of looking at security because um, with signature-based detection, you're looking for threats you know. With this kind of observer effect, we're we're looking at the things we know and how they behave, and then we're looking for the the changes in state, and then we take that change in state and we attribute that to a potential threat, a risk, type of malware, virus, threat actor, lateral movement, whatever the case may be, and it's a um, it's um, it's amazing how physics, biology, and all of these things can be used as inspiration for technological innovation. Very much like you say, right? We don't invent anything. Mm-hmm. We just discover it. Mm-hmm. Discover it. Or reproduce it in many ways. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the immune system. I love the stories. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, they, the... can, you, can you compare it to an immune system? Because also, like, the, uh, the way that I could, and also the way that I perceive the world is often, it is a little bit like, I relate to, I don't know, mathematical principles or computers or stuff. Yeah. Um, and even COVID, I kind of understood it as a human virus. It's kind of sitting dormant in your thing. That's the best way I could understand what's actually, or computer virus that's relating it to a computer virus, how, you know, that computer virus is mm-hmm. also, also inside your body. So can you give me the story of how that immune system works and how the, it's not a product, I don't know, boosts your immune system. Well, in, in all fairness, since, since the narrative belongs to another company, uh, I'm not going <laughs> to uh, I'm not going to say the immune system compared to to Snowed, but just in terms of this kind of defense. Sure. Essentially, you know, when a uh, when a rogue agent ent- enters your system, your which would be your body and some form of your know, your body then automatically fights off the disease or the the germ or the the threat or the right. you know the the attacker and that was a far better way of explaining to someone what the what the the technology did than me telling them look it's bayesian mathematics superior threat detection that's going to automatically respond and disable threats in real time. It's much easier to understand. Much easier to understand, right? I think, um, I think to that point, um, it's a beautiful analogy. Number one, I think, I think the point I'm trying to make is that marketing and salespeople, I've got a huge appreciation for for them when you see them, when you see really good marketing and really good sales. Um, I mean, what they do is both an art and a science. Um, and it's, you know, you always you always admire those things that you don't have. Um, it's it's one of those areas like at Snowed, we don't, we don't even have a sales team at the moment. And for a very long time, we never did have a sales team. A lot of our growth is through word of mouth, you know, clients saying good things about us and us picking up other clients. But when I look at some of the work they do like that, you can't you can't help but you know admire their work. Uh, so I think it's a bit of a double edged sword. I think on the one side I'm saying, hey, you know, as an industry, we've got to be careful not to let the marketing and the uh, you know get too um, reach further than the actual technology's capability. I don't, it's you know, trying, yeah. 
Yeah. But at the same time, you know, take nothing away. I probably wouldn't, Snow would still be sitting in my mother's kitchen if it wasn't for the beautiful marketing and sales that some of our competitors put into the market. So, you know, and it's an interesting point because a lot of the competitors think like, hey man, we, you know, we're, we're, we're arch rivals or we're enemies or we hate them. And I actually don't. Mm. Actually, I actually, I like what they do. I, uh, I, I like them. I admire their, what they're good at. Um, I wish sometimes I was as good at, at sales and at marketing, but I'm not. But I still have a deep appreciation for everybody. Yeah. In the ecosystem. I've heard, you, I've heard you say that before and I you know, also have a similar view. Competition is a good thing. And it's good, yeah. it's good people working on these same problems. And... Especially yeah. when you're, the yeah. people you're competing against are good, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the best because yeah. it just brings out the best in both them and you. No, like in a very, uh, in a selfish kind of way, you'll be thinking, well, uh, they're taking my budget. You know, it's going to the competition and it's not coming to me. Um, mm. But generally in the overall thing. Um, well, I have a theory. <laughs> I think we live in this world where we have this mindset of scarcity instead of abundance. When you ask me, I don't think any of my competitors are taking my budget. I'm not looking to eat any other SA company's lunch. I'm looking to create a conduit for SA companies to export SA companies, SA IP, SA talent, even if it's sales talent, to the rest of the world, right? Because I think it's that outstanding. So whereas, you know, another local competitor may feel, hey, listen, Nathan's not a good guy. You know, he's taking all our business. I'm not trying to take your business. Uh, what I'm trying to do is export businesses like yours. Um, thinking like like ours. Businesses like ours. Not like yours. Like ours. And take it to places like Thailand, Philippines, Cambodia, Indonesia, Vietnam. And um, so a lot of the time when we go and we get success in another area, we try and take other South African companies with us. Now, the one is a mindset of scarcity, right? Like, this is the market and it's all so small. And I'm saying, no, I have this mindset of abundance. It's a huge world. Most of the thought leadership out there, like if you go to a security conference, it's always a South African speaker. You think about the top security products. Now, we're, we're talking about Maltego. Maltego's world renowned. It's South African. Talk about Harun. South African. You know, um, you don't have to go far to find South African impact on the, you know, on a global scale, right? Um, let's export. Why? Why are we so? Why are we so content playing in the small part? Let's go out into the big ocean, and then you'll realize that actually, you know, it's that mindset of abundance. If you can make that paradigm shift. As my competitor, you'll realize that I'm actually a fit. Yeah. Uh, I've heard you say this mindset of uh, abundance versus scarcity, and it was like a little light bulb went on in my head. That was like, some wise words. <laughs> <laughs> but you're biased because you're my friend. <laughs> uh, but it's also from within. No, but it's kind of like you know, life is from within or something. It's and you know, you can create reality with your mind. It's all like your perception and stuff. Kind of that observer effect. I think it's something in quantum physics. I think they there's too definite. I can't explain it very well from kind of what I saw is like, if you don't film it, it may, behaves in a wave. If you do film it, it's praise. So it's completely two different like shapes of how the the, yeah. the, 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 the thing goes, but they kind of, there's definitely people just that uh, say that they can, electrons themselves have behaved differently, whether they're being observed or not. And then it's kind of like that, Perception. Ultimately, we're all living our own perception, and you know, making your perception the best that you can make it. My strategy to make it from within, and if I can manage to make it from within, then well, whether it's without or outside or not, it's to me it'll be like that. Most likely, I'll either attract it to myself, or I'll just guarantee it because I'll have better performance. But it almost doesn't matter if you brainwash yourself enough to. <laughs> yeah, you're getting deeply philosophical here, but yes, true. What you, what you, 
I do believe and the, the what your mind puts out there is what you will manifest in in reality right if you yeah. if if um if you put your intention out there um the universe will will um you know will 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 provide but if you're so if you're going to have those positive thoughts mm. and like you know the mindset of abundance you will start seeing the opportunities you'll start seeing everything as an opportunity rather than seeing everybody as a threat you know mm. and that's what's going to open up doors for you and you know just just to make it a little bit more real world right um if you're a provider and maybe you do you you have no relationship with us because you think we're bad guys and we're taking business from you. then you're probably not on our radar as one of those companies that we're trying to export into new markets right so yeah you're sitting in your bubble and you're like you know screw that guy you know he's taking business from us we're going to show him and you're thinking all these evil thoughts and you know mm. you you you're harvesting all these evil plans on how you're going to derail us when actually if you just got in the same boat with us we'd be accessing new markets and we achieve more um in synergy and i think you know there's an old thought of like business in business there's got to be a winner and a loser but in business there can be win 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 right the client can win you can win and people in the market your peers because they're not your competitors not necessarily unless you want to make them your competitors right uh they can win too right <laughs> and 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 people fail to see that collaboration beats competition competition is bad competition is not great for anybody because it drives prices down and it drives quality down and it drives innovation down um um i think it's um Peter Thiel, right? Peter Thiel is uh, well. He's famous for a lot of things, um, but um, the thing I I like about him is he's one of the founders of Planta, and I'm a big Planta fan, uh, along with everybody else in our office, and for some of their thinking. And um, uh, Peter Thiel says in one of his books, you know, you need to look for that creative monopoly. Essentially, he's just saying. we can't stay in this red ocean nothing good happens in the red ocean you need to go into the blue ocean you need to you need to use innovation and invention and create your own space and i think if i think that's what we're big protagonists of right is we've got all this intellectual capital but we're so often copying what's happening in the us what's happening in israel what's happening in the uk what's happening in china what's happening in Russia and we're not we're not believing in ourselves enough to say hey let's be different but not just different let's be not different for the sake of being different let's be different let's be better and i think if you took a lot of the people who exist in the market with us and if we all approach the market with that kind of thought process we'd all have our own unique sort of selling points right and as a and as a group if you took those unique selling points across africa you'd be solving one of the biggest problems facing the continent right because cyber is not just a problem because we're losing money but we're losing ip right the survey information for the resources that lie in the ground beneath us is getting stolen and then the resources then the resources themselves are getting you know history has a funny way of repeating itself what's happening in the digital world today you know it's fairly similar to you know what happened many years ago you well, know does does that make sense you want me to elaborate on that uh, yeah when i'll give you something recent right recently like what's happening today and and before just to be yeah, specific so recently let's take uh, i don't want to make too much of a political statement yeah But let, let's take something that happened recently Kenya Kenya was impacted by uh, anonymous Sudan um where they had distributed denial of service attacks on the Mpesa platforms in some government 
systems, etc. Um, anonymous Sudan is not anonymous, nor are they Sudanese. I don't know if you know that. Um, like you're not a techie, I'm not a cybersecurity, sir. <laughs> okay, so so um, you know the hacker collective, anonymous. You know the activist group, right? So anonymous Sudan given a name, anonymous Sudan, to attribute them to two points, right? One, the hacker collective anonymous, sure. and then Sudan to let you believe that they're Sudanese in nationality, but they're not. So if you go back and you look at the activity for Anonymous Sudan, you'll see they're Russian speaking. Now I'm not saying they're Russian or I'm not making any sort of political statement, uh, but you look at their infrastructure, infrastructure maps back to the infrastructure for Kilnet, um, which is also um, um, you know, Russian related. The point I'm trying to make is the... Um, the influence of, um, you know, other countries in African affairs is 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 strong. It's always been very yeah, strong. It's so scary to me, like, how safe is our government and, like, with this digital stuff, if there's a citizen, that's, like, so scary to me. So if you're thinking cyber is just purely about ransomware and a couple of bucks that, you know... Um, you know, the hospitals need to pay to attackers or whatever the case may be. You're missing the deeper point. Um, recently, we spoke at GovTech and I actually spoke about this and I used uh, Crypto AG as an example, which was encryption devices that were sold to many countries, not just in Africa, but across the world, Asia, etc. that 40 years later, we found out was a front for the CIA and the BSA, where they were eavesdropping on all our communications. Now, these devices went into... Uh, you know, all our critical um, communications, Office of the President or, sure. you know, embassies around the world, etc. And it was used to eavesdrop on friend and foe alike. Um, so when you think about cyber and you think about the impact of cyber, you're just looking at the top of the iceberg when you look at things like ransomware, etc. The majority of it lies beneath. It's... Everything from mass cognitive influence, which is like misinformation or information warfare, or psychological psyops, psychological operations, to affect things like elections. Very similar to what, you know, the U.S. claimed happened with Russian, with Russia and mm -hmm. their elections. That's been happening for years on African soil. You know, well, well, of course it's it's, it's happening. Yeah. It happened both for the Intel violence. Yeah, I don't know if you, yeah, like I don't want to go deeply into the topic, yeah. but um, the question is how much of that is attributed to, you know, like non-national threat actors, so actors from other countries, and why the the um, the influence in Africa. So having a strong cyber capability, both for South Africa and for the continent as a whole, yeah, so, is important. Yeah. 